Hello, everyone, and welcome to our master class for Canon Music Camp uh, for trombone here in the summer of 2021. We're very happy that you've uh, joined us today. I'm going to share my screen and we'll get started. So, yes, this summer is a little bit different. Uh, we're doing these master classes online um, in lieu of our typical three-week camp that we have every summer. Um, we are the premier comprehensive music camp in the southeast, and we hope that maybe next summer you can join us here in person. If you have any questions about the uh, the camp itself or uh, just want to you know, get some more information about Appalachian, uh, certainly the website there at the bottom of the screen, uh, canon.appstate.edu, can certainly be your first stop, but I can also be, uh, I would also be able to help you with any questions you may have. So my name is Dr. Joseph Brown. I am assistant professor of trombone here in the Hayes School of Music at Appalachian State. Um, and what that means is that I am uh, the trombone professor here. I teach trombone lessons to any uh, student that has trombone as their major instrument in the School of Music. Um, we have um, students of all majors here in the trombone studio uh, from the School of Music. And you know, also I teach, the, uh, I teach the trombone choir, conduct the trombone choir, um, and I also teach other courses in, in the brass area as needed. So things like chamber music or uh, trombone literature, that kind of thing. So a little bit about myself. I'm actually from North Carolina originally. I'm from the Charlotte area, Gaston County. And I uh, graduated high school there and then came to Appalachian as a student in the late 1990s and uh, spent a few years here as a, as a music education major. And then once I finished up my degrees here at Appalachian, I was a band director and I started my career also in Gaston County, went back home to, to take a job at uh, a middle school there in Gaston County, Greer Middle School, and um, then started to move around the country a little bit, found myself living back in Boone for a few years, and then into Texas, and then into Illinois, and then in Ohio, and in 2019, found, uh, found my way back to Boone um, when I started working back here at Appalachian again. Um, I'm really happy to be back in Boone, and we're, I'm certainly happy to be here with you today uh, in this master class. So what is a master class? Well, a master class is an opportunity for um, students who, let's, let's say, uh, in our case, all play trombone, um, to get together and to learn some, uh, some and to learn from each other um, and to learn specific things about trombone, um, focus on trombone. Uh, only and in a you know in a typical um, uh, master class format, what we might do is we might have several people perform for the class, and then we all give comments and we all learn together. Um, so if you were going to perform for a master class, maybe you would perform a solo that you had been working on, or an etude, or something like that. <coughs> Excuse me, and you would bring that to the master class. And you would perform it, and then we would you would get some comments, maybe from some other people in the master class, and certainly from whoever is leading the master class, uh, the the teacher, professor, um, this performer that's leading the master class. And it's a great way to uh, learn some things about your instrument that maybe um, you know maybe you wouldn't get in other in other uh, situations. So it's a it's a really fun opportunity to uh, kind of learn as a group. So. Um, let's get uh, let's just get right into some things. We're going to talk about a lot of different things today. Um, we're going to go through quite a bit of different topics. So here's some of our goals. Uh, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about tips for some for summer practicing um, to help you get ready for the new year of school. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about care and maintenance of our instruments. What things you can do in the summertime to to keep your instrument in tip top shape. Uh, we're going to talk about auditions, um, whether that's for uh, auditions in your school or for district band, state band, county band, those kind of things, um, college auditions, whatnot. Um, we're going to look particularly at the uh, upcoming solo material for 
all state band for North Carolina um, for the 910 and the 1112 uh, grade um, grades. And we're going to look at those pieces and look at the, the different things in it, things that you need to watch out for, different markings in the pieces, and talk a little bit about interpretation. So let's just go ahead and get started. Um, let's get to, let's talk about practicing for a few minutes here. So, you know, for me, the biggest uh, or one of the biggest things about practicing to to help ensure success is to be consistent. Um, you can be uh, you can practice a little bit every day, or maybe you're, maybe you've been in the past, like, uh, you know, maybe we've all been guilty of this at some point, you know, we'll play a lot one day and then we'll take some time off and, and you might play six hours one day and then not play again for a week. And you might say, well, I'm getting the same amount of time over the same amount of, you know, the same week. Um, but, you know, if you, if you practice with more consistency, Say maybe you don't practice six hours a day, but you practice an hour a day every day or, or, or even 30 minutes a day every single day and have a consistent flow to your practice schedule, you're going to see um, you're going to see progress at a quicker rate at a faster rate. Okay, so try to get into a routine of practice practicing regularly. So what do you do when you practice well for me. Um, and uh, you know, a lot of my colleagues and students that I've taught and, and a lot of people that I've worked with over my career, you know, a lot of what we do is we focus on the fundamentals of playing our instrument. You know, um, I always use the analogy of some sort of, uh, you know, some sort of athlete. So let's say baseball, I love baseball, I'm a big baseball fan. So, you know, if, if, if you're a pitcher, you're gonna spend a lot of time in your practice time working on the fundamentals of throwing a baseball. Um, if you're a hitter, you're going to work on the mechanics of your swing. Uh, if, you know, and you're going to work on your fielding, uh, the mechanics of fielding correctly, uh, so that when it comes to time for the game, uh, you're prepared. And you don't necessarily have to think about all those things. You kind of just, you know, you do them naturally because you have invested the time. Um, that's another analogy that a lot of that I hear a lot is you, you're putting a little deposit in the bank every time you do fundamentals in your practice time. You put a little deposit in the bank so you can save up for for a rainy day, so to speak. So, um, so for me, fundamentals are key. And what are the things that I like to focus on in my practice time when it comes to fundamentals? Well, uh, the first thing that a lot of people typically think about is or is your sound, your tone and exercises you can do to improve your sound and your tone. Um, so that really kind of leads us to long tone exercises. Um, maybe in your bands or your orchestras, you've done some, 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 some uh, long tone exercises. Sometimes they're called the Remington exercises, where you start on a B flat and work our way down chromatically, something kind of like this. so on and so forth. And actually, I'm going to stop my screen share just for a second so we can talk about this and I can show you what I'm doing. So that that's one type of a long tone exercise. Um, you can also use your just your mouthpiece to do these. If you're if you like to, to do a little bit of buzzing on the mouthpiece, you can certainly do that. <laughs> So on. Um, so, uh, one thing I do like to use um, is a piece of just regular old plastic tubing. I got this at Lowe's, um, and it fits my mouthpiece. Just put the mouthpiece in the end, and I can do the same uh, exercises or any other exercises with buzzing, for that matter. Uh... Um, actually, as an aside, I really like this um, this piece of flexible tubing, and I'll do a lot of buzzing 
exercises typically right at the beginning of what I do. And, you know, I'll, I'll do little bits of scales or I might do some long tone exercises, maybe something else. Um, I just in, enjoy kind of the, being one of the first things I do being uh, playing on this uh, piece of tube, because I feel like if I can make this piece of plastic tube sound pretty good, then I should be able to make that trombone sound pretty good. So um, at any rate, just wanted to show that to you as, as, a, as an option here. But yeah, going back to the, uh, to the long tones, um, another way you could do it is just to use your scales as a long tone exercise and start on, you know, pick a scale and just and, and play your scale as a long tone exercise. Lots of different ways you can do it. Uh, let's go. I'm going to go back to my screen share here. All right. So then after that, I typically will go into some sort of flexibility work. Um, and as, as brass players, flexibility is, is extremely important. We need to be able to move freely across the different um, partials or overtones of our instrument. Of course, the partials and the overtones are the, are the different notes that you can play like all in one position, right? So you can play a B flat and an F and a B flat and a D and an F and so on, on all in first position. Those are different overtones or partials. So uh, using using those and creating exercises on your own or you know maybe you want to get a book with some some of these exercises in it uh, one of my personal favorites is just simply called lip slurs it's by a composer named brad edwards great book for this um, and so what you want to do is is vary it a little bit you want to do some in your the middle part of your range you want to do some in the high the low maybe mix it up do a little of you know mix those up together you want to do some fast some slow so um, maybe you want to do something like, like this. Maybe you want to just do a very simple mid low range lip slur. seventh position then maybe do something in the higher range something maybe um something like this and so on okay and you can make up your own exercises uh, make them rhythmic try to um they don't all have to be rhythmic but sometimes that helps and it's a lot a lot of fun to play with certain types of rhythms um, but, uh, and then and explore different parts of your range. If you have a valve on your instrument, this is a great time to um, explore that and work on opening up the sound in the lower range through the use of lip slurs. So maybe I do something like this. down the slide um, using the valve so it's a great time to kind of incorporate that too i did a bunch of slow slow lip slurs right there maybe you want to add some faster lip slurs in there too to work not only on the consistency of your sound um, in between all ranges but now with some speed to it right so let's um uh, one of the classic ones from the emory remington studies <laughs> Lots of variations on that that you could do um, doesn't have to be that exact pattern you you get to kind of uh, you can make up some of your own exercises all right so lip slurs and flexibility is definitely something that I would recommend you doing on a daily basis um, then intonation and listening you know playing in tune particularly uh, trombone players you know we have the slide that we deal with on a daily basis right and making sure that we know exactly where a certain note is in tune on our instrument and being able to put the slide in exactly the right place every single time is going to be important um, as you you know as you learn more and more about the instrument so you know one of the ways i like to do this um, certainly tuners are very helpful um, you know, tuners are easy to come by these days. You can get one on, on any smartphone um, and use that. Uh, tonal Energy is a great tuner that you can get on smartphones. Um, but I also like to use drones. And drones are um, 
Well, there's lots, there's several different ways to do it, but uh, let's see if I'm trying to pull this up quickly on my, on my phone here. I have some drones uh, ready to go. Let's pull those up here. All right, and uh, I have an album called Cello Drones for Tuning and Improvisation, and it's just a collection of 12 different keys, and it's just, say, an E-flat, <laughs> a held-out E-flat for like 10 minutes, and you can use that to then play things with, listen to it, and it can, uh, compare your sound against the drone, make sure that you're playing in tune. Um, so this is where I like to get into scales a lot. So I'm going to put on this drone. Hopefully it's... There we go. So it's, this is the key of E flat. And I'm just going to just hear that drone sound coming from the speaker over there. And then I'll play my E flat scale against it. And you might hear me moving around certain notes. I might stop on a note, just listen. Um, make sure that what's coming out of my, my instrument fits with the note that's coming out of the speaker. It's not always going to be the same note. Right, uh, I'll probably stop on the E flats and listen to those really well, but I might stop on a G. I might stop on an A flat or a B flat and just listen to how it fits in with the E flat that I'm hearing from the speaker. So using my ears to really lead my intonation, okay? Um, I love tuners. I love to use a tuner. The thing about a tuner is that you're using your eyes. Um, you're pl you, play this, you play the note, you look at the needle on the tuner to see if you're getting it in the middle. And that's great. That's a great tool. However, you're not really using your ears as much. So I like to use the tuner, but then I'll also use the drones too to uh, be able to get both be able to not only see the tuner, but then also to use my ears and hear if I'm actually playing the, set, playing the note in tune. Because when you're sitting in a band or you're sitting in an orchestra, that's where you're gonna need that skill. You're gonna be playing with other people. You need to be able to tune and play with them, okay? Um, tonguing and articulation. This is where you know we, we want to explore different ways to play our instrument you know we don't always want to play everything the same way uh, we want to be able to do all kinds of different things uh, you want to be very much kind of a um, a chameleon when it comes to that you want to be able to change your style very quickly you know if you're playing legato over here and you need to change to staccato well you want to be able to do that very very quickly and the only way to really you know, improve on that is to work it into your practice time. So again, I'll use scales a lot of the time to do this. And um, what we'll do is, uh, let's see, we'll take that same E flat scale and I'm gonna play it in a, in a variety of ways. I might play it legato one time, then play it staccato another time. Maybe I'll play it with some marcato accents just to vary it and uh, explore different ways to play my instrument. Let me change my microphone here. I feel like I might be over overloaded. So lots of different ways you can you know, go about playing 
through your articulations and studying different ways to articulate. Um, I work that into my practice. Another good resource for this is the uh, is the Arban's famous method, Jean Baptiste Arban. Um, it is originally written for trumpet, but it's now been written and uh, transcribed and adapted for all brass instruments. Um, that's a wonderful, wonderful text. It has lots of different exercises in it that you can use to also work on your articulation and style. Um, let's go back to my share screen here. Uh, rhythms. So that go, takes me back to the Arban again. Um, just, just you know, using. You can use your scales to do this as well um, and explore different rhythms. Maybe you want to. Maybe that day you want to explore all the different ways you can play sixteenth uh, notes within a beat. So maybe you want to start off with your your scales playing a, a eighth note to sixteenth notes. Bum 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 bum. And then you switch it to two sixteenth notes and an eighth note. Bum 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 bum. And then the next is sixteenth note, eighth note, sixteenth note. Bum 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 bum. And so on. And just explore different ways or different rhythms that you can you can you can play through scales. And then of course you can take something like the Arbans as well, which has a multitude of different rhythmic exercises that you can do um, on a daily basis. And finally, sight reading. You know, sight reading is um, something that I try to do a little bit of every single day because it's a skill that you need to keep fresh. You need to keep doing it. Um, we'll talk about sight reading a little bit more in detail in just a few minutes, but that's definitely part of what I do on a daily basis. Um, now, this is not all the things that I work on in my practice time. Certainly, I work on my solo literature. I might work on some etudes or I might play some, um, play some jazz material or I might play you know, who knows, it might, I might have a concert coming up with an ensemble that I'm playing with and I want to work on the music for that. You know, there's lots of different things that I'll do, but I want to make sure that, um, that I am spending time on these fundamentals each day that I practice. Um, because again, like I said before, you're putting those little deposits in the bank every day. And every day you do that, that's just going to, it's just going to grow and grow and grow and it's going to reap, reap lots of rewards later. Um, uh, the last last thing on that slide there it says take time to practice things slowly when you get into your solo literature solo literature and etudes and things like that especially make sure you're taking the time to practice things slowly don't just fly through everything that you play because um, you'll see quick progress if you take time to to practice slowly take things apart see how it works um, we'll talk about that a little in a little while as well okay let's keep going um, a couple more practicing tips, you know, recording yourself is always great. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, you know, this year, particularly, a lot of us have had to become really good at recording ourselves because we were kind of thrust into that because of the pandemic. Um, so anytime you get a chance to record yourself, whether it's on a, on a cell phone or if you have a recording device, um, make use of that time and make sure you go back and listen to those recordings because those are going to be really great teachers for you. You know, the recording doesn't lie. It'll, it'll tell you everything. Um, so uh, make sure you take the time to, to record yourself and listen. The summertime is also a really great time to listen to music. You know, if you've never really had a chance to sit down and listen to some music that you're really interested in, say you're just, you, you, you're really interested in uh, orchestral music, um, symphonic music, and you just you want to learn some new music this summer. This is a great time to do it. Um, you can find scores to pieces online and uh, you know, put them in front of you while you listen to it. Um, Spotify has thousands and thousands of recordings. YouTube has thousands and thousands of recordings of, of, this, of this music. And the summertime is a great time to just learn some new music uh, and, and uh, just uh, become more well versed in in the literature. Okay. Um, another thing I want to I want to point out is it's always fun to to make a journal and write things down. You know, if it's the summertime and you want to set some goals for yourself, well, write them down so that you can make notes and see how your goal how it's going from day to day. You might want to write down a daily goal like today. Um, today I'd like to um, play my E flat scale in two octaves. Or today I'd like to, or this week, say I'd like to learn um, the first half of this solo, 
or by the end of the summer, I'd like to have all of my materials for all state band ready to go. You know, you'd be way ahead of the game if you did that. But that's those are some examples of some goals that you can make for yourself. Write them down and at the beginning of your practice session, and then at the end of your practice session, go back, look at that goal, see if you see if you if you if you uh, if you can check it off, and maybe make a note. Uh, yeah, I did that today, or didn't quite get it get there today, but tomorrow I'd like to do such and such and such and such. Okay, so make yourself a journal and um, kind of document your goals throughout the summer. Those last three uh, bullet points on the slides is uh, in tone, in tune, in time. You know, that's the, one of the things that I'm always anything I practice on a daily basis is I'm always thinking about those three words, uh, those three phrases in tone meaning how does it sound you know what do i sound like am i making the sound that i want to that i want to make am, am i making a sound that's uh that's close to the sound that's in my head <clears throat> um and if you're not sure what that's supposed to be how do you get there well um things like this what we're doing right now are great places to start um also just listening to people listening to recordings of trombone players um listening to uh orchestras listening to the trombone parts in orchestras listening to professional trombone recordings of course um anytime you get a chance to go to a concert and see a, a trombone player um go listen and uh all those things that you'll hear will help shape your idea of what a trombone sound should be <clears throat> uh in tune that just simply means are you playing in tune are you listening and are you playing in tune and then in time, of course, that refers to rhythm and uh, how uh, how you're playing the whatever it is you're playing at the time, whatever solo or etude that you're playing, are you playing it with good rhythm or how uh, are you playing with the beat? Are you or, you know, are you not? And if the answer is yes, then that's great. And if the answer is, well, maybe not yet, you know what what work you need to do. OK, um, and then the final one there, how free is it? That's something I always ask uh, my students to kind of gauge themselves on and, and grade themselves on um, whenever they play just to kind of get a gauge as to how you feel while you play is, is is are you playing with freedom does the air moving freely through the horn or does it feel tense um, usually you can just kind of give yourself a one to ten scale um, as to how free is it okay let's keep going so let's talk a little bit about care and maintenance of your instrument. You know, the summertime is a great time to check in on your instrument and see how things are going um, and make any repairs that need to be made or uh, just do any kind of maintenance tasks that maybe you didn't have time to do during the year. So, of course, uh, you know, bathing a trombone is a good thing. You know, you can always uh, take your instrument apart, put it in the tub um, with some lukewarm water. Um, not hot water. You don't want really scalding hot water because that could damage the finish on your instrument. But lukewarm water and just a little bit of mild soap. Let it soak, um, and then uh, you know rinse it off and dry it off. And you know that's certainly a, a, a great way to take care of an instrument. It's certainly something that we all need to be doing regularly um, to make sure that we're keeping it as clean as possible. I'm going to go over some s slide cleaning in particular here in just a moment, though. Um, valves, you know, if your valves are, if you have a valve on your horn, if you have an F attachment or if you're a bass trombonist and you have an F energy flat, um, it's a great opportunity to kind of just check out your valve, see how they're working, um, check all the screws on the, on the levers and make sure nothing's loose. Um, it's a good time to oil your valves if you haven't done that in a while. And if you're not really sure how to oil your valves, well, typically on most trombones, it's kind of, it's not really self-explanatory how to get oil inside of the valve. Um, let's see, let me stop my screen share for just a second. Um, so like on my instrument, I have a Thayer valve here, this uh, uh, cone-shaped valve. Uh, for me, what I have to do is I have to actually take off my tuning slide or my F attachment tuning slide and just drop a little bit of oil down in the tube here so that it will kind of drain down into the valve so that I can work it in there. Um, and if you have a rotor rotor valve, it's probably pretty similar, um, but that's that's kind of what I do. And it's a good time to also, if you have um, a thicker oil 
um, like a like a Hetman spindle oil. Let me grab mine right here. Not a spindle oil, but a linkage oil. This, this is what I use. This Hetman uh, linkage, and you can take a little bit of oil and make sure all the all the moving joints, like this little ball joint I have right here, where you can't. It's hard for you to see it. Where this uh, this uh, bar comes up and meets this other bar. That's a good place to just make sure I put a little oil right there. And I've got another one of those right here. And then right here where this, this spring is, that's a moving joint. So I always put a little bit of oil on all those joints when I have a chance. And the summertime is a great time to do things like that, um, to have a little more time. Okay. Um, go back to my screen share. Um, tuning slides. Yeah, you need to grease all your tuning slides and make sure that they're operational. Um, F attachment as well. That F attachment slide needs to be able to move. S certainly your main tuning slide needs to be able to move as well. It's a great time to check, to check on those during the summer. Uh, mouthpieces. Yeah, if you want to take some time over the summer and make sure you cleaned out your mouthpieces really well, <coughs> excuse me, check to make sure that the end of your mouthpiece that the, uh, say the end of your mouthpiece here, the shank is round. And if it's not, maybe uh, get that fixed. Um, it's also a great time just to check the rim itself. Make sure that there's no major scratches or nicks or anything like that that might cause you problems um, moving ahead as you get into the new year. Um, yeah, it's just a great time to check in on your mouthpiece. Make sure everything is the way you want it to be. Now. The slide, of course, is a very different thing for trombone players. It's, it's um, it, it requires a little bit more of our attention because we need to make sure, <coughs> excuse me, need to make sure that it's clean and in tip top shape because, you know, it, it affects everything we do. So I've got a little uh, video here that I'd like to show you about uh, slide maintenance itself. And it's about 10 minutes. So We'll, we'll take a look at that right now. I'll share that screen with you. Hi everyone, let's talk a little bit about slide maintenance. It's really important to keep your slide in tip-top working condition. Um, you know, it, it, the slide obviously affects everything we do as a trombone player, so it's really important to keep it clean, keep it in good shape, so that it can help you when you play instead of fight against you. For example, you know, say you really want to learn how to play legato really well. You want to play with a really smooth, connected legato sound. If your slide is slow or it won't uh, move easily, it's going to be really difficult for you to successfully play with a legato sound with a, in, in legato style. So what I'd like to show you here today are just two quick ways to clean the slide. The first is, is kind of an everyday check-in um, on cleaning the slide at the end of a playing day. And the second is one that you would do maybe every week or every two weeks, depending on how much you play. So let's do the first one, the, the kind of the everyday version, all right? So I've got my slide here. I'm going to take it and separate it, so it's inner slide from outer slide. I'm going to put the inner slide over here for just a moment. Get it out of the way. All right, so now I've just got my outer slide, and that's where most of your kind of buildup is going to be. You're going to have buildup all down that tube, all throughout the inside of the slide. Um, particularly, you know, if you're someone that um, maybe uses a, a decent amount of slide lubricant, um, and maybe you've got some buildup down there. So keeping a kind of a daily um, routine of cleaning the instrument will help kind of keep that from building up too much. So what you're going to need is a cleaning rod, a slide cleaning rod, and a piece of cheesecloth, which I've already got started here. Now cheesecloth is something you can get for you know, very cheap at, say, Walmart. Um, I got a big pack of it just recently. It's going to last me a really long time. Um, but you want to cut a piece that's a good bit longer than the cleaning rod, okay? And what you're going to do is feed the end of that cheesecloth through the hole on the cleaning rod, just like threading a big needle. Now, when I, what I'm going to do is I'm going to wrap this cloth around the cleaning rod. But when I do that, I want to make sure that I actually cover up the end of the cleaning rod so this little piece of metal here isn't 
kind of banging into the end of the slide as I clean it. Um, so what I want to do is I want to wrap it around the top first and make sure that I've kind of cushioned that top of that um, of that cleaning rod. All right, so I'm going to try to roll this down, and what I'm trying to do is to create at the top here, particularly because that's where you're going to get most of your cleaning done, um, is a is a diameter roughly about the same size as my slide tube, maybe just a little bit bigger, um, and you'll see why in just a moment. But I'm going to, so I think I've got that here, and I'm going to just loosely wrap this cloth all the way down the rest of the cleaning rod. Now when I get to the bottom here, what I want is I want to have just a little bit of that cloth left hanging off the end, and that's what I've got here. Because when I go to grab the cleaning rod to, to, to actually clean the slide, I want to make sure I can grab onto the cloth too in case something were to happen and you, know, you get it stuck in there and you've got, that way you've at least got something that you can pull on, uh, pull gently. So, all right, I think I'm good here. So now what I'm going to do is just kind of place the end of this cleaning rod in the outer slide. And you may have to kind of help it get started there. There we go. All right, and then I'm going to feed it on down. Now, the reason why I said make the end of the cleaning rod a little bit bigger than your slide, just a touch. Because what you're going to try to do here is create friction on the inside of your slide tube. That's going to heat up the slide tube and it's going to help melt anything that might be sticking to the inside of that slide tube. Any old slide of mix or trombotine or whatever. So you're just going to work that, um, that cleaning rod back and forth. And if you've done this correctly and you've set up your cleaning rod correctly, you're actually going to feel the slide tube getting warmer because that friction is rubbing against, or that friction is creating heat on the inside of your slide. I can feel it getting warmer here. And I'm kind of I'm working down towards the end here of the slide. Now I'm just going to kind of work my way backwards. All right. Now I'm going to do the other side, the other slide tube as well. Same thing. Again, it's heating up the outer slide here. Okay, and I feel pretty good about that. I feel like I got a good bit of whatever was in there out for the day. Okay, so the outer slide should be ready for the next day. Now with the inner slide, all you need to do there is simply just wipe it down with a cloth, wipe down the inner part, and you're good. You're good to go for the next day. All right, so that is the easy, quick way to make sure that your slide's not building up anything on a daily basis. Now, if you want to go a next level and clean it a little bit more, we can do that as well. So I'm going to uh, I'm gonna, uh, disassemble it again and place my inner slide over there. Now, what you're going to need here, instead of the cleaning rod, um, you're going to need some soap, just some very mild dish soap of some type, and I'm just going to use a drop or two in either side of my slide here. And then you're going to need some water. Now when I typically do this, I'll do this in either my kitchen or a bathroom, somewhere where I can have access to warm water. Um, you don't want scalding hot water, but warm water will help to dislodge anything um, in there as well. So, But today, I'm just going to use water from a bottle here. So I'm going to pour some into the slide here. And typically when I do this, and you know, you're, you're not trying to fill it all the way up, but you know, I'll try to fill it maybe halfway or so. Um, so that essentially inside I've got water up to about here maybe. So now I'm going to take a long flexible slide snake. We've probably all seen these before. Um, and I'm going to start on one side and I'm going to scrub that soap into the slide. I'm just going to try to dislodge anything that might be inside my slide there. And that's why the water is good. It will help you kind of, um, you know, just like when you're washing dishes at home, the water will help kind of wash and scrub things away. Um, 
And you can take that slide uh, snake and make sure that you get all the way around and go down into the slide crook and, and scrub that out as well. So that's a that's where a lot of a lot of stuff's going to settle. Okay. Now the slide snake is long enough that I can keep it going, and it should just come out the other end. There it goes. Okay. So now I'm going to. Um, Bring that all the way out here, and now I'll do the same thing. Same thing on this side. I'll just take the slide snake and I'll scrub down this tube. Okay. Same thing. Just trying to get get down, particularly around down around the crook of the slide. Clean that out really well. All right, then pull out your slide snake. All right, now what I should have in here is some soapy water. And I've got a little pan right here so I don't get water everywhere. But then you're just going to pour that out. Okay, now I've still got soap residue on the inside of my slide. So I want to, again, go back to the water and run some more water through this outer slide. And do your best to maybe put your thumbs over the end and just kind of rinse the soap out the best you can. Let it wash it back and forth. Okay, now then I'm just going to let that run out. And I just want to keep repeating this process until the water comes out clean, comes out clear. That means you've gotten all the soap out of the slide, all the residue, anything else that's that was hanging out in there that you were trying to wash out. You've gotten it all out of the slide. Maybe one more and I think we'll be good to go here. One more time. Yep. Pretty good. Now if you wanted to go back and then uh, take that cleaning rod with the cheesecloth on it again and, and just run it down in there just to give everything a nice quick dry off you could definitely do that, um, but you don't have to. You can, you can go right to the next step, which is lubricating the slide. Um, let's see, let me put this back on. Oh, before I get to lubricating the slide, you would also want to do a similar thing with the inner slide, with the slide snake. The only thing you want to be careful of is on your inner slide, you have, on every trombone, you have a lead pipe. Now a lead pipe is, on some trombones it's fixed in, it's soldered in, you can't move it. On some you can, you can remove it, like on this one you can unscrew it and remove it, pull it out. Um, but that lead pipe goes down, you know, roughly down to about here or maybe just a little farther. And it's on the inside of this, this pipe, okay? So if, you, if you're using a, a slide snake, when you're going in this direction, you don't want to pull back because you could get the slide snake caught on the end of the lead pipe and damage it. So what you want to do, what I typically will do is just go one direction. Okay, so I'll go this way with it and take the slide snake out the end of the slide, pull it through, and I'll do that a couple of times. Um, that way I don't get the slide snake caught on the end of my lead pipe. There's no way I could get it caught if I, do, if I just go in one direction. Um, now I'll do the same thing on the other side of the inner slide. You can again, you can use soap with this as well to help clean out the, the inner slide as well. Run water through it just as we did before until it comes clean and then your inner slide's good to go as well. So then you're going to put that slide back together. And then you need to lubricate the slide. Now, for me, what I typically like to use is this Yamaha Trombone Slide Lubricant. Um, you know, you might have your own favorite. You might like Slide-A-Mix. You might like Trombotine um, or some other brand. Uh, for me, this is what I like the best, this Yamaha. Uh, that's, that's just my personal preference. But all you need there is just a little line of it up and down part of the slide. You don't have to go all the way up and down the slide, the inner slide. 
to, uh, to properly lubricate it. Work that in, spray a little bit of just plain water on there, um, and you're good to go. So uh, hopefully these tips can help you to keep your slide clean and working really well um, in the summertime and beyond. So uh, let's take it back to the rest of our master class. All right, so you know, hopefully uh, that was helpful to, to just get some ideas of how to keep the slide clean on a daily and or a weekly basis. Um, it's also, you know, summer is also a really good time to just check it for dents. Make sure that you don't have any dents in your slide. The smallest little microscopic dents can really uh, affect how your slide moves. Um, so it's a good time to check for those as well and to get any repairs done that uh, you might need. Uh, if you want to go and take your instrument to a repair technician to have it uh, professionally cleaned, you could certainly do that in the summertime as well. It's a, a really good time to do that uh, also. So, all right, that's just a little bit about some summer care and maintenance issues with our trombone. So let's, let's talk a little bit about auditions. You know, we all have to do auditions at some point in our musical life, you know, whether that's an audition for a chair placement at your school, whether it's an all county band or an all district band, all state, or if you're a senior in high school, maybe you're thinking about auditioning for music schools um, for the following fall after your graduation. Um, you know, lots of auditions. And when you get out into, if you, if you go on to become a professional musician, auditions are a regular part of life there too, whether you're auditioning for a, um, you know, position in an orchestra or you're auditioning for a solo competition or something like that. Um, there are, there, auditions are always going to be part of your musical life. So uh, here, here's a couple of things that I have found in my own career and through talking to colleagues and other, other friends that, uh, that seem to be helpful in, in audition situations. So before your audition, you know, if, if, you're, in, if you're in high school right now, um, you know, your auditions for county band, all state band, all district, a lot of those are going to have three components. They're going to have scales, solo, and sight reading. So that's kind of what we're going to focus on here. Um, with scales, you know, some of the things that you might want to try, um, you know, when you audition for all district band, let's say, uh, you have a list of scales that you're required to play for that. Um, that might not be the full list of 12 major scales. So, Take, maybe take it upon yourself to learn the other major scales that aren't on that list. You know, go ahead and learn all 12 and certainly learn your chromatic scale um, as well. And I would encourage you to play your scales in a variety of styles and rhythm patterns. You know, we talked a little bit about that earlier in the master class when I was talking about some of the things I do in my fundamentals time. Um, you know, play your scales separated, play them legato, play them. Um, in rhythm patterns um, that aren't the all state band pattern. Maybe you want to play them all in half notes today. Maybe you want to put a drone sound on and play them in whole notes and really listen to your intonation. Um, because I'll tell you, when you go to an audition um, and you know someone plays all their skills extremely fast, maybe they have, maybe they can play them faster than anyone, but they don't play them in tune. I would much rather hear someone play the scales a little bit slower and play them in tune and play them with good sound and good technique um, than someone that can just really fly through them at a high rate of speed um, without much care for anything else. So, you know, play them in a variety of ways. Play them slow, play them faster, play them with a drone so that you can listen and, and hear, listen to the intonation of that scale. Um, play them with a tuner. Play note by note. Look at your tuner. See if you're playing those notes in tune. Um, and I also say there, play your skills in full range. And that just, that just means that, you know, um, if, say, for example, uh, the, uh, the D flat major scale, which is typically asked for on all district, all state band auditions in one octave. Well, you know, maybe you want to learn the lower octave of that scale and take see if you can go all the way down to the lower D flat if you've got a F attachment on your trombone. Or maybe, you know, you uh, you you play your chromatic scale from E, low E up to the higher higher B flat. Well, maybe you want to just expand your range a little bit and say, hey, can I go lower than the E? Can I go higher than the B flat? Why not? You know, it's 
you certainly want to practice the things that you're required to do for the audition, but you know, why not challenge yourself and just see if you can expand that a little bit. And the reason I say that is because if you can expand and go past those limits, then, you know, the limits that are prescribed for the audition um, should be, you know, well within your capabilities. Um, in terms of your solo preparation in advance, you know, like I said before, practice things slowly. Don't just start at the beginning of your solo and play all the way to the end of the solo and then rinse and repeat. You know, I, I, I know that in high school, I was guilty of that. Uh, from time to time, I would start at the beginning and just play straight through my solo and then go back to the beginning and do it again. And I would do that several times and feel like, okay, I've really accomplished something here. Um, whereas if you take, take it apart and play in smaller pieces and take the time to play things slower and really understand what's there, um, you're really going to understand the piece as a whole and, and you're going to understand it at a much deeper level. <clears throat> I had a teacher uh, that used to call that, uh, quote unquote, programming the computer. You know, you would make sure that you knew all the little bits and pieces of the code, so to speak, so that when you ran the program, <laughs> um, it, there, it, was, it, was, it felt really natural. Okay. So, you know, take the time to practice things slowly, take it apart, play it in small chunks. Um, it's like a, you know, really, really nice Lego sculpture. You know, you look at a really awesome Lego sculpture. It's got lots of detail on it. You say, how did they make that? Um, well, they probably didn't just, you know, build it all at once. They had to build, they had to plan it and build it in pieces and figure out how those pieces were going to fit together. So, you know, when in music, if we can take things apart and really understand the whole, <clears throat> the pieces of the whole, when you go back to put them together, it's going to be that much clearer to you. Um, and with sight reading, you know, the first thing is to just make sight reading part of your everyday routine, as I was talking about before. Uh, let's look at sight reading in, in <coughs> excuse me, actually this right here. Let's, uh, let's talk about sight reading um, in a little more detail. So, you know, first thing is just to make sure that you're doing it. Make sure that you're sight reading, um, you know, as much as you can. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, read as much music as you possibly can. You know, ask your band director, your orchestra director for some extra materials that they can they can they can find for you. Um, go to uh, you know you might if you've got access to something like a hymnal or a songbook of any type. Um, it doesn't necessarily always have to be in bass clef either. You can find other clefs and read all kinds of different things. You know, just the more that you can put music in front of you and try to read through it, the the more comfortable you're going to be with sight reading. Um, and uh, the more that that skill will develop. Uh, there's also imslp.org, which if you're not familiar with that website, it's a uh, library of music that's available in the public domain. So it's uh, all free to use and it's legal. Uh, you can go and download pieces there and, and use those for sight reading practice. Um, you go and you can just search for say trombone and you'll find lots of music to, to that you can choose from and, and read from or you might want to search for another instrument put bassoon in there put tuba in there put um put voice put voice in there like baritone or tenor voice and see what comes up and see if you can find something to sight read lots of music available out there if you're just willing to look for it now when it comes to how to practice sight reading or how to do the process of sight reading I go back, I go back to my junior high band director and something she taught me um, when I was in the seventh grade, uh, which is the STARS method. And it still works for me to this day. S-T-A-R-S, -S, um, the S meaning signatures, key and time signatures, um, T meaning tempo and other expression markings, uh, A being accidentals, R meaning rhythms, but that meaning kind of like rhythms that might catch your eye as being uh, maybe uh, unique for that piece or maybe a little more difficult to read. Um, and then the last S is for signs, like the, the roadmap stuff, like repeats and DC and DS, alfine and all, all those things. Um, so and then also I also will tell people to look for patterns, look for familiar things like scales and arpeggios that you've practiced all this time. Um, then when you see it in a sight reading passage, <clears throat> you can see the chunk of it and say, oh, that's just a, that's an that's a that's an F major scale right there. I don't have to think about all the individual notes in it. I can play my F major scale in that spot. Or 
maybe you see some uh maybe like a scale in thirds or something that look a pattern that's very familiar to you because you've practiced it before um and uh, the last the last point there on that slide just uh, is just a link to sightreadingfactory.com if you're looking for like a generator sight reading generator those kind of things exist out there um you can plug in some information and it'll generate a, a short sight reading example for you. Um, those are fine. I like those too. Um, but I would honestly rather go and read um, music from, say, an etude book or a hymnal or something off of IMSLP that, um, that's not just computer generated. Because sometimes, uh, sometimes those kind of melodies can be a little disjunct, which might be you know, good for some parts of sight reading, but um, I'd almost rather go use some of the other things. But that's there too, if that's something that you're looking for. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, let's let's do this. I've got a quick sight reading example that I want to show you. Let me find the correct. All right. So if I'm looking at this piece right here, um, and this is say I was given this at a at an audition, an all all district band audition, and they say okay. The judge says, okay, you got 30 seconds to do this. Go. All right. So what am I going to do in those 30 seconds? Well, I'm going to go through my STARS method. I'm going to say, okay, S, signatures, key and time signature. My time signature is common time, 4-4. Four, four. My key signature is 1 flat, B flat. All right, good. Got that. T is tempo and other expression. T, uh, the tempo is andante, slow walking tempo, and expression, like dynamics, articulation. Um, I see some dynamic markings. I've got piano. I've got uh, diminuendo. I've got a couple crescendo marks. Um, and then expression uh, or articulation. I mean, um, I've got a lot of slur markings. So I'm going to be doing a lot of slurs in this, uh, making sure I see that. Okay, A is for accidentals. Uh, okay, I'm going through it real quick. I see second measure. I've got a C sharp. Uh, the second line, I've got some B naturals and a G sharp. Um, and then a little farther down, I've got an E natural, I've got an E flat, um, a couple of E flats. So I've quickly gone through my accidentals. R is rhythms. You know, I got a lot of I got half notes, quarter notes, eighth notes, um, nothing too out of the ordinary. If I go way down to the bottom of that page, I see a, some 16th notes and I see a 16th note triplet. And I also see a little, uh, a little ornament there on that last C in three measures before B. So those kind of things I would want to point out to myself to watch out for. And then the last S is signs, repeats, D, C, D, S. Uh, I don't see anything here. Uh, no, no roadmap issues here. So I'm good to go. All right, I've gone through everything and I feel like I could go ahead and sight read this. Um, so I'll sight read the first couple of lines here. spot that I didn't really want to because I breathed before the slur mark ended. Um, otherwise, I felt pretty, pretty good about that. And I felt confident, at least I felt confident that, you know, I wasn't going to be surprised by anything because I went through my STARS method and um, felt like I was ready to go on. All right, let's go back to my share over here. Um, so on the day of an audition, uh, you know, make sure that you get a lot of sleep the night before, that you feel really comfortable with that. Um, make sure that you eat before an audition. You don't want to go into an audition being hungry, um, you know, because it'll distract you. you know, go ahead and eat something that morning. Um, drink lots of water, stay hydrated, because um, well, if, you, if you don't stay hydrated, it's really easy to dry out and you get dry mouth. Um, so make sure you stay hydrated on the day of the audition. 
If you have time, say your auditions later in the day and you can do a little bit of warming up, do your routine early in the morning and then take a little time off. That's always, I feel, a good thing to do. Sometimes you don't get that option because the audition's at 8 a.m. <laughs> um, so just, you know, do, do your best with that. But um, one thing I do typically tell people to avoid is to make sure you don't play too much the day of the audition or certainly going into the warm up room at the audition site and you see all these other all these other people in there playing their instruments and they're just going through their scales and their solos and people are just playing and playing and playing. You want, you get, you, you really want to get in there and play a lot. Um, but resist the urge to do that, you know, play a little bit, but uh, just know from experience, I had a, I can tell a story that one time, I believe I was in the ninth or the 10th grade, I forget, but I went into this audition and um, got into the warm up room and I just played way too much. And I, by the time I got to the audition, itself i was really tired not not fun so um avoid playing too much right before the audition if possible okay so from this point on in the rest of the uh rest of the master class i want to talk a little bit about the the all state materials for this coming year in north carolina we're going to start with the um actually let me share that with you while i've got this screen up here let's get the right one up Hopefully you can see both of these. Hopefully you can see my notes over here on the PowerPoint, but you can also see the solo itself. All right, so let's uh, let's talk a little bit about this solo. We're going to start with the nine ten solo. I'm trying to make this so I can see it, both of them on my screen. Okay. Um, so the solo is, uh, these are new solos this year. Um, this is Audition Solo 2D. It's from um, from uh, a website called auditionsolos.com. Uh, the composer is a uh, trombonist named Brad Edwards. Um, so what I've done is I've broken this up into those three areas we talked about really early on in the, today's masterclass, in tone, in tune, in time. Now, in tone, let's talk a little bit about what we want to do with our sound on this piece. You know, we want to play with a supported sound always. You want to make sure that you're moving your air easily through and freely through the instrument. Um, you want to make sure you're not playing with a pinched sound. Um, so if you're looking at the at the the music right there on your screen, you know, it's the difference between something like have a little bit more of a pinch sound but we want to try to open up and really blow air freely through the instrument you know, that's that really free movement movement of air through the horn you want to resonate you want to put your horn to resonate as much as possible um, and you know, make sure that you you really make a difference between anything that's legato, marked as legato, and anything that's marked as separated or marcato. So, for example, um, these first two opening phrases on the first line, you know, these are marked with slur markings. So you're going to play those really smooth and connected. But then in the in measure five, you know, we, we kind of switch. We switch to a little bit more of a separated style. You've got some staccato marks. Um, and then you've got, uh, see, so measure five, six, seven. You got some sixteenth notes that aren't marked with any slurs at all. But then you go right into a slurred section on the next next beat. So you want to be able to switch quickly. Um, so I'm going to play a little bit of that that from the beginning, so you can hear the difference. <laughs> Um, hopefully you were able to hear me switching from uh, more of a, a, a slurred legato connected sound to a more separated sound. So you want to make sure that you make a big difference in those and that they don't sound kind of the same, um, which is easy to do if you're not really focused on that. Um, 
in tune. You know, much, much of this piece is based in G major or its relative minor, which is E minor. You know, the first, uh, the first two lines are squarely in G major, and then when we get to measure nine, we do kind of switch over to the relative minor E minor. But all both of those scales are essentially, or both of those scales are based on the same key signature, one sharp, F sharp. So um, maybe it's a good opportunity to put on a drone, uh, play through that G scale a good bit before you play, before you practice this piece, just to really kind of hone that scale in your mind and make sure that you're really in tune with listening to the intonation of a G major scale before you start. Um, because what you want, you don't want your half steps and your whole steps to be unclear. So for example, if I play this opening phrase, this opening line here, those first four notes. I want to make sure that the F sharp to the G is really an F sharp to a G. It's a true half step. Da -dum, da -dum. And not, I'm just approximating the F sharp. Right. I don't. I don't want my F sharp to be too sharp because I'm not getting all the way out to the fifth position for for that F sharp. So making sure that that we really listen to our intervals. Make sure that the F sharp is a true half step between the F sharp and the G. Um, and then in the next phrase, things like the um, like the D up to the E. Making sure that uh, you know we play a true whole step from the D to the E, and we don't just kind of approximate where we think that E might be. Really, really listen. And if you've if you've spent some time with your scales and some drones, that will be you'll have a much bigger chance of success there. Um, in time, you know, use a metronome when you practice. Um, start slow and work your way up to the posted tempo. And we have quarter note equals ninety two at the beginning here. So, you know, set your metronome to 92, get an idea of where you want to end up, and then maybe back it off, you know, 20, 20, 20 or 30 clicks, go down to like 72 or 62 and work your way back up from there. Start, you know, take the time to, uh, to, to practice things slowly. Um, then the other comment I have there is listesso tempo, and the definition of that, you see that in measure nine, listesso tempo. Um, that means the same tempo. So we're not going to change our beat. You know, if our beat at the beginning is right here. When we get to measure nine, even though we're changing our time signature to six, eight, we're going to keep this same pulse. So now instead of one and two and three and four and now it's one lolly, two lolly, three lolly, four lolly, one lolly, two lolly, one lolly, two lolly, one triplet, two triplet, one triplet, two triplet, or however you like to count a six, eight, one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, um, but the pulse stays the same. The quarter note of the four, four, and the dotted quarter note of the six, eight are going to be exactly the same. And so essentially, you can put your metronome on 92, and you can leave it there throughout you know the pieces you're as you're practicing through through it just make sure that when you get to measure nine that you don't either speed up and go too fast or slow down and really drag through the six eight you want to keep the pit you want to keep the pace moving exactly as it was before okay the one caveat of that the one little thing that might be a slightly different is at measure five you see the word animato so you might want to make it a little more intense right there which might mean to you know move a, move forward a little bit with your tempo just a little bit so maybe ya da dee da dum and then measure five yum bum bim bum bum ba dum bum 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 bim ba dum and you might want to move just ahead move ahead just a little bit but then when you get back to measure nine you want to go back to the tempo that you had at the beginning so those are some small some small details but things to watch out for there in terms of some tuning issues there are some notes in this in this piece where um, you know the trombone just does not play in tune very well in all 
uh, in all parts of the overtone series. And so certain notes we have to either play with a slightly longer position or slightly shorter position. Um, so like in measure, let's see, let me get my little marker here. So like uh, right here, this E above the staff, um, that entire partial starting on F in first position, E in second position, E flat in third position, D in fourth and so on, it, they're all sharp. And so we have to lengthen all those positions to make them in tune. So instead of right in second position, uh, this is what, what I call a two plus. Okay. Um, so, so it's essentially, if you put, put your slide where you think second position is, and then move it out slightly from there, move it slightly more towards your bell, not, not very much, just we're talking like quarters of an inch or half an inch here, I mean, very, very small amount. Um, that will help that note be in tune. The same is true for uh, this F sharp here <clears throat> and this G here later in the piece. Um, those are also notes that are that are out of tune, but that whole partial is flat, and so we have to move those notes in with our slide. So instead of third position for the F sharp, we're going to play a shortened third, or what I call a minus three, and then the the G is a shortened second position. <clears throat> so. Uh, instead of playing those just right in third and right in second you're going to play a little shorter third and a little shorter second <coughs> excuse me okay so let me get rid of those <coughs> um and then also i put on the on the slide there b's and c's c naturals are also one of those that are, have to adjust slightly, then, and you have to bring those in. So that would be like a shortened four and a shortened three. Um, I know this might seem really nitpicky in like a small detail, but <clears throat> if you're just playing all the all the notes in there uh, in the positions, and all your second positions are the same, all your third positions are the same, <clears throat> you're going to end up with certain notes that aren't in tune. Excuse me. And you don't want that. You want to play, as I've, as I've talked about already here, you want to play in tune, in tone, in tune, in time. And part of playing in tune on trombone is to adjust certain positions. <clears throat> uh, alternate positions, A sharp. I did, I made a note of that because there is one spot that you could use an alternate position here if you really wanted to, um, which is this A sharp right here in measure 10. You could play that as a fifth position, A sharp, um, a shortened or a minus five. Um, but you don't really have to. I think you could if you wanted to, um, but you, you could use you could easily do that in first position as well. Remember A sharp uh, being an enharmonic note to B flat. So it's the same, sounds the same as a B flat. So first position, or you could actually use fifth position there. Um, I have a, I have a, I have a, uh, recording of this that I made that I'd like to share with you. So I'm going to change the share and I'm going to put the recording up with the let's see here. Uh, sorry, just one second. I had that one ready and then it's Okay, here we go. All right, so we're going to share that and share this. Okay. All right, hopefully you can, again, you can see both the video and the music. All right, so here's the, here's the 9, 10 minutes old. Thank you. 
All right. So what you saw there was um, what you saw there was the the whole the whole solo, and then at the end I went back and I played the second ending, the B ending. So if you need to play the B ending, you've got uh, you can also look at that ending and and, and listen to that as well. Okay. Um, all right. Let's move on to the high school solo, the eleven twelve solo. Um, so what your your solo here is the uh, more so symphonique, and let me pull up the correct solo here. Pull that one up. I need that and this. Okay. All right. So what I've done here is uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the andante section, the opening section first, and then we'll look at the allegro. So. Uh, again, I've split this up into three sections, in tone, in tune, in time. So let's look at in tone. You know, the first thing I say is, what's your most beautiful sound? <clears throat> what's that sound in your head that you want to emulate? You know, um, how do you, uh, how do you replicate that? I think you need to know that from the very beginning because you want to make your most beautiful, resonant, uh, smooth, connected singing sound here at the very beginning of this, of this piece. Um, and it really needs to feel like you're singing so sing it's like uh, singing a duet with yourself at the unison so it's like in your head you're singing this tune and you want to play along with that you know it's the most the be most beautiful singing sound that you can make in your head and then play along with that and, and match it <clears throat> and we are playing in legato style here at the beginning so what does that mean well, that means a couple of things. You want your air to be constantly in motion. If your air ever stops, the legato sound will stop. You want to connect your air or connect the notes with the air. You want to kind of glue the notes together with the air. The air never really stops, okay? Um, and you want your slide to move really quickly. You know, it might seem counterintuitive when you're playing something that's slow in tempo and sounds smooth to move your slide fast, but if you if you do the opposite and move the slide too slowly, what's going to happen is you're going to get a lot of glisses in your sound. It's going to sound a little bit messy. So move the slide quickly and then use the tongue as little as possible. Um, you might uh, you might think of like the, the tongue touching the back of the teeth like like a painter that's painting a picture and they dip the brush in the in the paint and they barely touch the canvas with the paintbrush and just leave a small streak. <clears throat> that's how much you want to touch your uh, teeth to the back or touch your tongue to the back of the teeth. <clears throat> so that you're using the tongue as little as possible. <clears throat> then when you change your style, at measure 18, uh, it goes to, uh, you see, we kind of drop the, now we're, if we're over here at measure 18, we kind of drop the, uh, the slur markings, and we get a new direction, con anima, and marcado. So um, we're going to play with a little bit more what we call front on the notes. <laughs> if you think of notes having a beginning, middle, and an end, you want to play with a little more front. A little, uh, a little harder front on the note, but you still want to play with some length and you want to play connected. Um, it doesn't mean to play short or separated. <clears throat> uh, in tune, 
You know, record yourself and listen back. Uh, grade yourself <clears throat> on your intonation. Grade yourself on your intonation. Um, that very first interval, that's always one of the, you know, the more challenging spots in the piece is just to get started because we have a big leap from the B flat up to the G flat. <clears throat> and what I would say there is to maybe uh, practice it by taking the second note down an octave for a while. Play B flat to G flat like this. So you can really hear the the G flat by itself. Maybe even take the first note down an octave as well. you've got that G flat, the sound of that G flat in your head, uh, that'll give you a lot more um, information and kind of soar over the top of that first, that higher G flat. <clears throat> Think about soaring like a, like a bird flying off a cliff, kind of soar over the note, um, aim over the top of the note. Uh, instead of reaching up to grab that note, kind of soar over the top of it. Uh, you might also think of using the first note kind of as a springboard because you kind of you, you'll you'll play the B flat and kind of sit into it and then kind of spring up for the G flat. Um, but that those those should help with the intonation up there. Um, <clears throat> again, listen to your half steps and whole steps. Make sure that you're really truly playing those. <clears throat> and then any alternate positions that you use. Any alternate position that you use, they've got to be perfectly in tune. I, you know, you want to be able to close your eyes and um, not tell the difference between the two. You say you play an F in fourth uh, instead of an F in first, you want to be able to be able to tell the. You don't want to be able to tell the difference. You know, if you've got your eyes closed. Okay. Let's see. Let's go on. And then in time, you know, subdivide. Maybe even go to a different level <clears throat> of subdivision that, than you normally would. Maybe you typically would subdivide eighth notes. Well, maybe you want to go to sixteenth notes here. Um, really, uh, really hone in your your time by subdividing every single pulse. You may even want to practice this with those longer note lengths, <clears throat> note lengths subdivided. So, for example, let's take. <coughs> Uh, measures measure five starting on beat two okay because in measure seven coming up i've got these dotted eight sixteenth notes so maybe i want to try it like this <laughs> subdividing um try, i'm subdividing everything at, at that lower at that higher level um i can really hone in and focus in on those dotted eight sixteenth rhythms and really make them precise <laughs> uh, make sure that you do make a difference when you see markings that indicate changes in intensity like at measure 18 we were talking earlier about the con anima <clears throat> then in 31 when you have tranquilamente so con anima, typically, um, you're, when you hear recordings of this piece, you're going to hear the performer move the tempo ahead a little bit, play, play just a little bit faster. You'll hear that in my recording in just a moment. And then at the Tranquilamente, um, you know, relax the tempo just slightly, just you know, make it a little bit more easy right there. Just make sure that you do make a difference there and that in, in the, the, someone that was listening to you could really understand the difference between the the the, ch the changes that you're trying to make. 
Okay, uh, let's let's listen. I'm going to play for you my recording of this. So let's get, let's see. All right. Again, hopefully you can see both on your screen. Um, all right, here we go. Okay, so the only other thing I want to bring up right now are some of the use of alternate positions that you may have seen me doing um, in the video there. Um, I, I like to use uh, fourth position for uh, F quite a bit. Uh, like, for example, uh, well, you saw it right near the beginning, right here on this F, using a shortened fourth position here that leads into this three and a half, third and a half or a shortened third position on the on the G flat. Okay. Um, and another one that I like to use is, uh, let's see, there's this F, F right here, six position F. And then I'm also using a valve position here. This one is valve three and a half. <laughs> it's hard to write on this, um, on the B flat there which uh, is right next to the uh, valve, the long second valve, long second position with the valve for the C flat there. Um, kind of works together. Use the, the F again over here. Um, and I think, oh, and there's an unused, this F in six as well. This B flat in fifth. Um, so there's a couple of options there, a couple of places. I think I used this B flat also in fifth as well. Um, so there's a couple of places in this piece where you can use some alternate positions to kind of help the technique uh, of the slide, you know, make shorter movements with my slide. I try really hard when I'm playing to, um, you know, not make large movements with my slide unless absolutely necessary. If there's a way that I can make the the, the move from one part of the slide to the other a little easier by using an alternate position. Sometimes I'll do that. Um, don't do it all the time. Um, don't do it every single time, but <clears throat> every now and then I will do that. Okay. All right. Let's, uh, let's go on now to the second half. 
here the 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 allegro let me move this down so that we can all see that all right and then uh, again in tone in tune in time <clears throat> In tone, you know, the first thing I say is don't play too loudly at first. It's just one forte. You know, save some, save some of that um, intensity for the ending, where you really do need to play with a really big sound. Uh, but do play with the full sound. Hear your sound all around you at all times. Um, and you know, again, we don't want to play too short here. We want to aim for mostly for notes that touch, uh, particularly as we get <clears throat> towards the end. And we get into all this triplet, uh, all these triplets and things over here around measure 51. Um, you know, we don't want to play those uh, too separated or else kind of lose our style. So we're not playing legato here. I'm not asking to play legato. Um, but you do want to play with a little more length on the notes so that we can hear the pitch. A lot of times what will happen in these faster movements is you'll get... If you don't uh, have enough air behind the tongue, you know, if you, if you get a lot of tongue, but not a lot of air behind it, you'll hear a lot of articulation, but you won't hear a lot of substance to the pitch. So, for example, like on that first opening E flat scale, um, <clears throat> if we just hear, you know, and I, I hear a lot of, I hear a lot of the tonguing, but I don't hear a lot of the pitch. Um, I'd rather hear you know, I'd rather you put a little bit more air behind that tongue so that every note can speak and can be heard um, and can be full. Instead of. You know, play through and, and make sure that you've got some uh, some air behind the tongue there. OK. Uh, let's see. In tune, take the time to practice slowly. I keep coming back to that, but it really is important here. Um, major scales and arpeggios. Make sure that you are, if you're practicing these frequently with the drones, with your drones and tuner, you have a much greater chance of success. So you've got a lot of scales in this. You've got the E flat scale at the very beginning. <clears throat> you have an E flat scale in measure 50, uh, what is that, 56, um, that just extends on up. You know, it's an E flat scale, but it doesn't stop it. E flat, it continues on up to the B flat. That's just an E flat major scale. Um, but if you're taking the time to play those with the tuner or play those with the drone, that's going to really help you out. Um, and then <clears throat> also you've got um, in measure 51 and then in 63, where the, these little triplet sections, um, these are essentially embellished chromatic scales. So if you notice the first note of each triplet is just a chromatic scale, E flat, to D, to D flat, to C, to C flat, to B flat, or then later on G flat to F, to F flat, to E flat, to D, to D flat. Um, so if you really wanted to, um, you know, go another level, uh, play that chromatic scale with a tuner. Make sure that you're playing every one of those notes, the ver first note of the triplets. Make sure you're playing a true chromatic scale. And then what you're doing really is you're just moving a half step away on each one of those. So like this you could do it you could practice it with just uh, without the the trip without the the middle note um, so that when you go to you know perform it um, that the the, the the chromatic scale itself is in tune um, and then when you move past steps away, those are also going to be in tune if you've taken the time to kind of really dissect it and take it apart like that. Okay, um, let's see what else. In time, resist the temptation to rush. Yeah, it's it's that's a that's a that's a that's a very common one here. It's just to really want to get moving fast. Um, but if you check your 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 uh, tempo marking, it's just uh, it's quarter note equals 104, which if you tr put that on a metronome, might not be as fast as you think it is. So uh, resist the temptation to rush and subdivide everything. You know, I've talked about that before today. Um, be sure your eighth notes, triplets, and sixteenth notes are all even within the beat. You know, take the take a scale and practice moving between those three rhythms. <clears throat> so if I'm if here's my beat. Okay, I'm going between eighth notes, triplets, 
fifths and sixteenth notes there. Um, <clears throat> just making sure that everything is really even so that when you go to play the piece that you're not, um, you know, you're not compressing your triplets and playing them too quickly or you know, maybe uh, playing a little too slowly on your sixteenths or something like that. Make sure that everything is even and all within the beat. Um, I've got a list here of suggested alternate positions and these all pretty much go with my rule of thumb which is to uh, uh, keep half steps in adjacent positions when possible. Um, I use fourth position D quite a bit throughout here and I've got a list there of different places where I use it. Um, typically when, when it comes right up next to an E flat I'll put the D, uh, put the D in fourth position just so that uh, again I'm not moving a long way with my slides just right next to each other. Um, short fifth position B flats, <clears throat> use those a lot in here too. Um, measure 52 and then also measure 55 and 65 um, just to keep things uh, moving ahead a little bit there. Uh, let's see what else. Uh, then again short fourth position F in measures 56, 61, and 63. Measure 65 a sixth position F um, as we come down this scale over here. Oops. There we go. Uh, right here, this this F right here, putting a, putting that in sixth position because it's next to a G flat in fifth position. Um, that's the half steps and adjacent positions rule I was talking about a second ago. Because the F the F and the G flat are right next to each other, I think I'd rather go to there for the F instead of coming all the way back to first position for the F. Uh, just uh, makes the technique a little bit quicker right there. Okay, uh, measure 71, the trill, right here. You know, we get a lot of questions about that, about what we should do on trombone to play trills. Now, I'm going to stop the share just a little bit um, for just a moment because I want to show you... <clears throat> Um, on trombone, when we trill, we typically do it as, as a lip trill. Now, a lip trill is essentially um, a really fast lip slur, and it's going between two notes in um, partials that are right next to each other. So in this case, uh, you come, you, you start on a C, and then the next note is D, and that's the one that has the trill mark on it. So what are you supposed to do there? Well, what you would typically do on trombone is you would play that note in lip trill to the note above on the trombone, which in this case would be an F. Um, now, yeah, if we want to get really technical about it, the trill really should be to, to a, to, from a D to an E flat, but since that's really almost impossible to do without getting the valve involved, and valve trills are okay in some spots, but um, right here, they, they, it kind of... I don't know. It's it's a, it's a matter of taste uh, and what you want to do. I uh, I I would prefer the lip trill myself. So um, so anyway, what we do? Actually, let me switch my mic. Okay. So what we do? quickly I'm in fourth position on the D. I'm in fourth position on the D. And I'm moving quickly between the D and the note that's above that F. You can also do that in first position, but I like to do it in fourth in this case because of you know what's coming next is the E flat. Say, oh, I, can't, I, I can't go that fast. I can't go that fast between the D and the F, and that's okay. Um, try, try to to work it in, and see if you can if you can get a little bit of a of a lip trill, even if it's a little bit slower one. Um, again, like anything else we work on today, you know, start it slow and work it up um, in, in, over time. You know, if you can't immediately go right to the uh, to the uh, to the lip trill uh, quickly. That's okay. That's okay. You take your time. Take your time. Um, you also might notice that I added one extra note in there. I set up the uh, the trill with a note right before it that's not actually written there. I played an E flat like on the and of four. So 
played the C, or excuse me, I don't three, excuse me. C, E flat, D, bum, 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 um, just to set that up. Um, now, if, if you don't want to do the lip trill, you can simply play a, a, a whole note, or excuse me, a dotted half note D. You can go that route, okay? But if you want to incorporate the trill, um, try, see if you can try the lip trill, just, just explore it and see what you can do with it. Um, <clears throat> it's essentially a lip slur, a really fast lip slur, okay? All right. Uh, let's see here. Last thing here, I believe, is that we're going. I'm going to show you the video of of my performance here, and then we'll wrap things up. All right. Let me move this so that we can all see it. Okay. So here's my re uh, my recording of the Allegro from uh, from Morso Symphony. All right, so you know, uh, the last thing I'll say here is uh, I've put a couple of uh, quality recordings there that you can listen to for reference. Um, I'd love for you to come back and listen to my recording, um, but if you want to hear some others as well, um, a couple that are available on Spotify that I would really recommend: uh, Christian Lindbergh's recording, um, Abby Conant, her recording, um, and Elaine Trudell, his recording. Um, those are all three very different recordings, but all really great. Um, so if you just if you're in Spotify and you just search Morso Symphony and search those names, you should be able to find them. On YouTube, um, there's a couple of really good ones on there. I really like these two that I've listed here. Um, Colin Williams, um, his recording. Uh, it's a live recording from a from a convention a few years ago, and also there's a really great recording by. Uh, New York City freelance tremonist Nicole Abisi. Uh, she's put together a really great recording right there as well. And those are all available on Spotify and YouTube. So I would encourage you to go and listen to those as well. Okay. Um, that's, about, that's about it for today. Uh, I think we've covered a lot of topics today. Um, I want to thank all of you for, for being here to, to listen and to uh, um, you know, hopefully you've been able to find something in this master class that's been helpful for you. Um, if you have any questions about anything you've heard today, um, please feel free to get in touch with me. Again, my name is Dr. Joseph Brown. I'm Assistant Professor Trombone here at Appalachian State University. And my email address is, as you see there on the screen, brownja9 uh, at appstate.edu. And uh, like I said, I'd be really happy to help you in any way that I can um, throughout this year. Um, I'm, ha I'm happy to answer any questions you may have uh, throughout the year. Please get in touch with me. Um, certainly, we hope that you would join us next summer for Canon Music Camp in the summer of 2022. 
Uh, the dates are Ju June 25th to July 16th. And again, that'll be held here at Appalachian State University in Boone. Um, if you have any other questions about Canon Music Camp, you can find that information there uh, at the website uh, there on the screen, canon.appstate.edu. Um, again, just to wrap things up, I want to thank you for for taking the time to listen to this today, and uh, hopefully we'll be in touch with you soon. So uh, have a great year. Um, we're all really looking forward to the time when we can all be back together and making music here on campus again. Uh, thanks a bunch, and take care.